Okay, so this evening's subject is thoracic anatomy, and it's not from the point of view of an anatomist. I'm going to go over thoracic anatomy from the point of view of a clinician, of an emergency clinician, and with a particular view from the college exam and the things that they've put into the college exam in our experience over recent years. We're going to, what I'm going to do is I'm going to play a video. It's about 10 minutes. It's a YouTube video and it's going to cover a lot of the anatomy of the main structures that we're going to be focusing on. The thoracic aorta begins after the aortic valve and its first branches are the right coronary artery which we'll pick out here and the left coronary artery which we'll pick out here entering the heart. As we progress up the arch of the aorta, the next branch is the right brachiocephalic trunk. So on the right side, the, uh, the branch to the head and the arm comes off as one branch, the brachiocephalic trunk. As we go up that, the common carotid, carotid artery goes off and the re remainder continues on as the right subclavian artery. Its first branch is the internal thoracic, sometimes known as the internal mammary artery, and then it carries on before giving off the vertebral artery and the thyrocervical trunk before carrying on as the brachial artery. On the left side, the carotid, the common carotid, comes off separately. So that comes off the arch of the aorta, and then the left subclavian comes off, and that in the same way gives off an internal thoracic branch then the vertebral branch and then the thyrocervical trunk and going on to the brachial artery. In this image we can see how the right subclavian artery relates to scalenus anterior. We can see that the as it as the brachiocephalic trunk divides to the common carotid and the right subclavian artery it gives off the internal thoracic also called the internal mammary the thyrocervical trunk and the vertebral that we can't see here and passes behind scalenus anterior and over the first rib. If we look at the aorta from inside the chest on the left hand side we can see that the arch of the aorta runs backwards uh, before coming to the left hand side of the vertebral column and running inferiorly. And just after the left subclavian we can just see the left subclavian at the top here with the vagus nerve running over it but just after the left subclavian as it turns down there's the ligamentum arteriosum the ligamentum arteriosum is let's see if i can bring in an arrow the ligamentum arteriosum is just at this point here and that marks the point after which the aorta is bound firmly to the vertebral column at the back and it's around that point that tears of the aorta take place when rapid deceleration causes the heart to swing forward and the aorta tears across between the left subclavian and the ligamentum arteriosum. Beyond that point the descending aorta gives off branches with each interver between each um, at each subcostal level and also small branches from those penetrate the vertebra and join the into the spinal canal providing additional blood supply to the spinal cord. There's one particularly large branch of this which is often at around T8, T9, I think it's known as the uh, artery of Adamkowitz, which is a particularly large one which supplements the circulation to the spinal cord and is an important branch to the, because if it's damaged by surgery or trauma or whatever it can cause ischemia of the cord um, or necrosis of the cord. Looking at the veins of the thorax let's start with the right subclavian vein and I'll pick that up here where it passes over the first rib separated from the subclavian artery by the sclenus anterior muscle so it's anterior to the sclenus it's, it's in front of the sclenus anterior and the first major structure to join it here is the external jugular the external jugular which is coming down fairly subcutaneously 
as it then progresses into the chest it's joined by the internal jugular yeah this is the internal jugular and the the, the combination of those then forms the brachiocephalic or in right innominate it then takes a major branch coming in which has got the thyroid the thyroid veins on the other side structure is quite similar from the left we've got the subclavian vein the external jugular meeting it then we've got the internal jugular and we'll talk about the thoracic duct in a minute and then that becomes the left innominate and those two together combine to form the superior vena cava now I'm going to talk about the azagous vein in a minute which joins the superior vena cava at this level and here we've got the internal thoracic vein we've got the same on the other side this diagram focuses on the veins of the thorax and the abdomen and I'm going to just focus on the thorax at the upper part here and the, the areas that you can see in blue those are what we've already talked about so we've had the subclavian veins on each side the external and internal jugulars all combining to form the superior vena cava which is here but let's just focus on this here this is the azagous vein taking in the subcostal veins and that's joined by a connecting branch from the hemiazagous on the other side so here's the hemiazagous connecting across, taking in the subcostal veins on the other side, coming across, joining the azagous and draining into the superior vena cava. In this image, the superior vena cava has been cut away, and behind that the arch of the aorta, and also part of the esophagus. So what we're looking at here is the posterior mediastinum. We can see the azagous vein here on the right-hand side, being joined by the hemiazagous and then coming up to wind forward and join the superior vena cava and that's to the right of the esophagus and if we look at to the left of the esophagus we'll see the thoracic duct thin walled structure coming up from the abdomen before coming up towards the internal jugular vein passing behind it and joining close to the junction of the left subclavian and left internal jugular and entering the venous system Focusing on the phrenic nerve, this arises from the third, fourth, and fifth cervical roots. And here we are on the right hand side, I'm going to pick it up on the right, coming down, passing behind the superior vena cava here into the mediastinum, then coming down, running down the right hand border of the heart, branches off to the pericardium running down the pericardium on the right hand side before giving off branches to the diaphragm providing motor innervation to the diaphragm muscle but also sensory innervation to the diaphragmatic peritoneum on the other side of the diaphragm so that's the right phrenic and if we come over and pick up the left phrenic here's the left phrenic here also coming down into the mediastinum here for running over the left side of the pericardium on the free border of the pericardium giving off branches sensory branches to the pericardium and to the mediastinum before providing motor branches to the left hemidiaphragm and sensation to the diaphragmatic peritoneum on that side in this image we're going to pick up the two vagus nerves as they come down with the great vessels so on the right hand side here we have the vagus coming down and the recurrent laryngeal nerve which we'll see again in a minute winding around the right subclavian before it's able to ascend back up towards the larynx on the left hand side here's the left hand vagus left vagus also coming down into the mediastinum focusing on the right vagus here we can see it here and we can follow its course down through the neck with the great vessels internal carotid common carotid coming down the neck and at this point it crosses the right subclavian artery 
and here it gives off the recurrent laryngeal branch which passes up towards the larynx and the vocal cords and as it carries on down into the mediastinum it gives off a number of branches to mediastinal structures to the arch of the aorta to the bronchi to the lungs and then carrying down to the abdomen and giving off branches subsequently to the stomach and the gastrointestinal tract and so on. Focusing on the left vagus now and here we pick it up within the chest we follow it down as it comes through and over the arch the aorta and then the left vagus gives off the recurrent laryngeal nerve further down on the left side it's in the chest and it's the ligamentum arteriosum just here that we met earlier that causes it to wind round at this deeper level before going round the back of the arch of the aorta and back up to the larynx. Now I'm conscious that it's not necessarily that easy to follow those videos because of streaming issues so just to go over a little bit of this. So we started off by talking about the aorta and of course that arises from uh, above the aortic valve. It gives off the right and left coronaries and then begins the aortic arch and that's, that's in the thoracic plane which we'll meet later which is from the angle of Louis to T4. And the arch of the aorta, the first branch coming off is the right is the brachiocephalic trunk which divides into the subclavian and the common carotid and then off the right subclavian we have the vertebral artery we have the internal mammary artery and we have the thyrocervical trunk before the artery goes back onto the arm coming back to the arch of the aorta again on the left side of course the common carotid and the left subclavian come off separately and they go through the same branches as we met on the right side. Then the arch of the aorta winds round and um, strictly speaking it becomes the thoracic aorta from T4 onwards and it gives off a, a long series of arterial branches, the, inter the intercostal arteries. Some of these supply, uh, are bigger than others and have branches that go through to the vertebral canal. And in particular, somewhere in the lower thoracic region, and it varies a lot from about T8 down to about L3, L4, is a larger arterial branch which goes and joins the uh, spinal cord arterial plexus. And that's important because in the context of a large aneurysm or trauma that damages the branch to the vertebral canal, there can be ischemia. Now the spinal cord is supplied by the anterior spinal artery which is a single artery which runs down in front of the cord and the two posterior part spinal arteries there's a pair and they arise right at the top from the vertebral arteries so the vertebral arteries join to become the basilar artery and about the, just before the join each of the vertebral arteries gives off a branch which becomes the anterior spinal artery so the main supply for the spine is from the top and there's a, a interconnections around the spinal cord but then extra arterial supply comes in from the aorta and issues with the aorta can affect blood supply to the cord and that's the reason for, for just spending a minute or two on that. So that's all I want to say about the aorta. What about the veins? Well to some extent of course the veins are match the, the arteries so if we start at the top and um, we've got the veins coming down from the head and the arms so the internal jugular on each side comes down and joins to to the subclavian on each side to form what's known as the left innominate and the right innominate or brachiocephalic just lateral to where the internal jugular joins the subclavian vein we have the external jugular so that's different to the arterial um, to what we have with the arteries we have the external jugular and of course that's quite a subcutaneous it's visible on the neck in many people subcutaneous vein 
and those the veins join together the left and the, uh, the brachiocephalic trunk and the innominate to form the superior vena cava and just behind the superior vena cava as we can see it here is the opening of the azagous vein and the azagous vein is a very posterior structure it runs just in front of the vertebral canal on the right hand side and it takes the venous return from the ribs from the intercostal veins at each rib level and they come into the azagous vein and then drain up into the superior vena cava on the left side there are the hemiazygous veins and they're quite variable but essentially the intercostal veins on the left side drain into the, the hemiazygous or the accessory hemiazygous which then communicate across in the front of the, the vertebral the spines and join the azygous and drain into the superior vena cava. Okay so that's all I wanted to say on the veins. The phrenic nerve well the phrenic nerve, of course, arises from quite high in the neck, C3, 4 and 5, and then descends down through the mediastinum and runs on either side of the pericardium. So on the right-hand side and left-hand side, they run vertically along the pericardium before they reach the diaphragm and provide motor supply to the diaphragm muscle. Of course, the diaphragm is tenderness in the middle it's a tendon in the middle and all the all the um, the muscular fibers are peripheral and they're innervated by the phrenic nerve however the phrenic nerve does also have sensory fibers to the pericardium to the mediastinum and also to the diaphragm on its peritoneal side so peritoneal sensation is carried in the phrenic nerve and that's why pain arising from irritation of the peritoneal side of the diaphragm, for example, from blood in the abdomen or pus, subphrenic pus, causes referred pain in the tip of the shoulder which, because of the C4 innervation and, the, and this uh, the common origin. And so that's why you have pain in the tip of the shoulder from diaphragm irritation, and that's the phrenic nerve. We move on and talk about the, the vagus. The vagus, of course, is one of the cranial nerves, number 10, and it comes down with the great vessels, the, to begin with, with the internal, internal carotid and the, the internal jugular. Descends down with them into the thorax, and on the right-hand side, it, there's a, a branch, the recurrent laryngeal nerve, which innervates the vocal cords, comes off at the right subclavian artery where the subclavian joins the, the common carotid to form the brachiocephalic that's where the right recurrent laryngeal winds back to get up to the larynx on the left hand side the vagus carries on further down and the recurrent laryngeal nerve on the left side winds behind the ligamentum arteriosum before traveling back up towards the larynx but the vagus nerves on both sides then carry on around the esophagus into the abdomen, innervating the stomach and the intestines and so on, providing parasympathetic fibres further on into the gut. Here's a view of the vagus nerve on the right side. The point of showing this is just that you can just about make out the recurrent laryngeal nerve where the the Sub, right subclavian artery is seen there with the, the recurrent laryngeal nerve winding around it. The next three pictures are pictures just showing the surface markings. How does the internal structure of the chest relate to what we can see from the outside so that we know our landmarks? So a few things to point out here. So if you just start by seeing the first rib at the top, then the second rib, the third rib, and then the fourth rib. You'll see that the nipple in the male lies over the fourth intercostal space. So that's the first thing to point out. If we go back up to the top again, we'll see that the lungs go right to the top of the pleura at the top of the lungs, 
and that that is two to three centimetres above the clavicles at their medial ends. This is one of the reasons why the lungs are vulnerable when we put in a subclavian internal line, because the lungs go so high and are just so close to the clavicle at that point. Okay, and we can see at the lower end of this image, we can see how the lungs don't go as far down as the limit of the pleura. So the purple colour, that's the lungs, and the light blue colour, that's the limit of the pleura. Of course, that, the difference between the two, varies in inspiration and expiration. And as the chest expands during inspiration and the lung expands, they fill up more of the pleural ca cavity and that difference reduces. If we look from the back, just to point out a few things from the back here, and we've seen different structures have been shown in this diagram on the left and the right, so the lung hasn't been shown on the left. But on the right side, we can see how the lung comes down in this image to about the just the beginning of the 11th rib posteriorly, but that will vary with respiration. But the pleural cavity, the pleura, comes down to the 12th rib. On the left side, we can see the spleen there between the, the ninth and 11th ribs. And we can see how the tops of the kidneys are just hidden behind the ribs. Here's another image shown from the, from the left lateral position, again showing the position of the spleen and the lung. Uh, but as I say, that varies with the stage of respiration. The purpose of this image here is to just focus on the intercostal vessels and the insertion of chest drains. So if we look at the, the, the we see we have the, ves the vein at the top, then the artery, then the nerve, V-A-N, underneath the ribs. And of course, they run in a groove underneath the ribs. But they are vulnerable if a chest drain is inserted just below a rib. And that's why we always insert a chest drain just above a rib, and that's the point of, of showing that. So, so, so you can see that we go through muscles if we stick close to the ribs and go just above a rib. In the questions, I mentioned the thoracic plane, and the point of mentioning this is because although it's in one sense an anatomical concept, it is quite useful clinically and when we read images, CT scans and, and x-rays. And this is something known as the thoracic plane, which divides the upper mediastinum from the central mediastinum. It begins at the front at the manubrio sternal angle, and that's also the, known as the angle of Louis, where the manubrium and, and the, um, the sternum meet. And the plane runs through to the junction between T4 and T5, T4, T5 disc. It's also pretty well actually where the T4 body is. And in that plane, a number of important anatomical landmarks are along that plane. The trachea bifurcates into the right and left main bronchi. It's also the point at which the azagous vein empties into the superior vena cava. It's also the point at which the pulmonary artery branches left and right. It's also the level at the beginning of the aortic arch and at the end of the aortic arch. And anteriorly, it's the point where the second rib meets the manubrio sternal junction. If you remember, the second rib then has a costal cartilage which joins at the junction between the manubrium and the sternum. So a number of things happen at that point. The real purpose of this slide is just to mention thoracotomy because it has come up once or twice in the exam chest anatomy as it relates to thoracotomy. So in a patient who's had penetrating trauma to the chest and has, had a, and has, has suddenly lost their output in the resuscitation room, it's one of the indications for doing an emergency thoracotomy. And an emergency thoracotomy, it's usual to enter on the left side in the fifth space, so that's the space below the nipple line, opening it extensively, so opening the fifth space right back into the axilla and using a strong clamp to spread the ribs apart to then access 
the pericardium. And you can see from the image here where the heart is with respect to the wound. So once we've opened up this wound and clamped it wide, we can access the pericardium. It's usual then to try and deliver the heart into the wound. And the next thing is to make a vertical incision in the pericardium. And it's a vertical incision because the, the phrenic nerve runs vertically and we've less risk of damaging the phrenic nerve, which can be difficult to see in, in a trauma patient. And we open the pericardium to release any blood that might be in the pericardial sac. In some patients, it's appropriate to do the, a, a right-sided thoracotomy as well, in exactly the same level, the fifth intercostal space, and even to continue the wound between the two in what's known as a clamshell incision, so that it's possible to access major bleeds on both sides to deal with the pericardium and also to cross clamp the aorta. So that's the, that's the reason to show that particular slide. And then I think this is my final slide. This is just to remind us of the radiological anatomy. What is it that we see when we look at a chest x-ray? Remembering, of course, that chest x-rays, like all x-rays, only work on the basis of four densities. There are only four different densities in an x-ray. Bone, which is the whitest. Air, which is the, the opposite, the least white. And then in between, water density, which is what muscles look like and the liver looks like and so on, and fat density. And everything we see is produced by a contrast between different densities. And so on a chest x-ray, what we're seeing is the junction between these different densities. And so this is what we're seeing here, the trachea coming down center with subclavian vessels going off either side of that at the top. Then as we come down, we have the arch of the aorta and the left heart border below that formed by the pulmonary artery. And then the auricle of the left atrium, that's the left atrial appendage. And then by the left ventricular free border. And then the right heart border is made up of right atrium predominantly. The, the right ventricle sits anteriorly on the heart as we see it in a chest x-ray. As we go up, we can just see a little bump caused by the azygous vein before we're into the superior vena cava above that. And then of course we have the pulmonary arteries which are visible to a couple of divisions in as they go into the lung fields. And of course at the bottom of the of the image we'll have the diaphragms and we'll have the gastric bubble below that and through the heart we should be able to see the descending aorta running just lateral to the vertebral bodies and we should be just able to see the vertebral bodies through the heart shadow.